Good morning, everyone. This is Brad Adams from the Tennessee chapter and welcoming you back. This is the fourth week um, of our CHFP preparation webinar series. Uh, next week will be the fifth and final chapter in our journey here and getting everybody ready to take that test. Um, so quick housekeeping things for this morning. Um, if you've got questions as we go throughout the webinar, please enter them in the questions box um, inside of the GoToWebinar uh, control panel that pops up on the side of your screen there. That's the best way for us to, to get to those and uh, kind of triage them and, and get them lined up uh, to, to give to Christoph. Or if it's things that we can answer as, as the uh, moderators here, we will do that as well. Um, Secondary reminder about uh, continuing professional education certificates. Um, we will issue those at the after the within a few weeks after the very last uh, webinar. We've actually got to pull all that together and see. I know a lot of people have had you know you've made three so far. You maybe you missed one. Um, so we've got to go through and look at all that and make sure before we get the the right counts. So we issue those certificates for the right number of hours. And uh, as always, if you want to get your CPE credit, you need to answer the polling questions uh, when those come up throughout the webinar. I think Christoph has told me um, they're going to be a little bit more spread out throughout rather than having uh, batches of them at the end of particular sections or towards the end of the day. So uh, be on your toes and be ready for those to be popping out at you. Um, that is, I think, it for kind of housekeeping items other than um, I know I have been delinquent on getting some stuff updated on the website. I'm going to work on that during today's webinar. Um, and for those of you who are wondering what website I am talking about, um, it's on the Tennessee Chapters uh, website is where we've been posting any, uh, any additional worksheets or page corrections or things like that that Christoph has sent me. And so that website is TNHFMA. Dot org, and then to go to this particular page, um, put in slash chfp hyphen webinars. That'll jump you right to this page, um, and that's got all the information, including links over to the YouTube videos if you want to go back and review anything from the uh, webinars as after they've happened. We usually get those posted within a day or so of going out. So um, without further ado, I will turn it off to. Christoph and also to uh, Shannon Ebenkamp from the Indiana Pressler Memorial Chapter, who is going to be handling our polling questions for today. Brad, thank you very much. And Shannon, thank you for being our pollster today. Uh, also, Martha is on the line. Martha, you are the chief organizer and wizard behind all of this. So thank you very much for your time and Brad for your masterful hosting. Of, of these webinars. We're talking today about uh, the remaining three sections of this material and you might wonder how on earth are we going to make it through this much stuff in one class. Uh, remember we have spent the last four weeks on the big three topics, financial reporting, budgeting, forecasting, and revenue cycle, each of them with their share of quantitative uh, topics. There's less quantitative stuff here in the remaining three topics, which we're all look, I'm lumping together today. And uh, by the way, these times up here are wrong. I know we're starting on the half hour, not uh, the full hour. And the same next week, we're starting the same time again. Uh, so what we're doing today, theoretically, uh, accounts for a third or more of the exam, but uh, so much of it uh, is narrative material that I don't think as a, as, as, as a practitioner in healthcare financial management, you should not have significant problems with this material today. So I think we can afford to cover it all in one fell swoop today. So we're going to start with uh, internal controls. Uh, what belongs into that topic is also compliance. That's probably the biggest chunk of what we're talking about today. Contract management, not much to talk about other than a little bit about managed care. And uh, I, what I have done here, and you will have noticed it if, if you look at the book, I have inserted here a, a quite a significant section on 
value purchase, uh, uh, value uh, healthcare uh, and healthcare reform. So uh, value-based purchasing, and um, that takes us somewhat afield from the curriculum itself. But uh, with and with me having taken exam three years ago, I don't know to what degree uh, this piece of healthcare reform, the quality reporting, and the met the met the metrics of uh, mortality and severity of illness, and the ranking of hospitals, have made it into the test itself. But in any case, that's where I parked that. Then we do disbursements last. It's, I think, the easiest component of the entire curriculum. That's why I put it last. Uh, there are just really two quantitative topics there to talk about. One is inventory, and the other one is staffing. So that's the game plan for today. So let's get launched here. Uh, so internal control has its own module. This is just to show you the introductory screen or one of the first screens on the online HFMA online study guide module. If if indeed you are looking at that, this is an hour long module. We're going to start with a very classic definition of internal control. There there have been fancier definitions uh, since since this time, but I think this one captures what we need to concern ourselves with when it comes to internal control. And that is this classic definition here, which comes out of the old uh, um, AICPA uh, standards for uh, auditing, for auditing organizations, the audit standards, so to speak. And um, it no longer appears in the modern uh, codification, but it, in spirit, it is still there. So internal control is about four things, and they are described here. Safeguarding of assets, checking the accuracy of accounting data, promoting operational efficiency, and encouraging adherence to prescribed managerial policies. The first two have to do with transactions. The last two have to do with general stuff in, in, an, in an organization, in an enterprise. It's interesting that operational efficiency is a goal of internal control. And that has not changed in even the modern definition of internal control. And then the last one adhering to prescribed managerial policies, that just makes good sense. So there is a division here between transaction-based internal controls and sort of overarching internal controls. You see that here elaborated a little bit on the next slide. The first two, operational efficiency and adherence to managerial policies, are typically called administrative controls, whereas the other two, and they are elaborated here and, and made into really four different uh, objectives, are called accounting controls, and they have to do with transactions, with the recording and uh, checking of transactions. And transactions are the, um, the way in which uh, business events uh, transpire and, and, and translate into numbers and dollars, essentially. So those are accounting controls. I told you there were two on the other slide. Uh, here I'm telling you there are four. The, the two that you've already seen is this are this one, access to assets. On the prior page that was called safeguarding of assets. It says it's the same thing, safeguarding of assets and access to assets are basically talk about um, splitting responsibilities uh, in such a way in an organization that uh, you can't put your fingers in the cookie jar and take some money out and then at the same time manipulate the records in such a way that uh, you're hiding that the money is gone. So that's what division of responsibilities or um, access to assets are all about. The first two make a lot of sense, just simply uh, bona, fide, bona fide if you think about them. <coughs> Excuse me. Turn my microphone off here for a sec. OK, I'm back. Um, that uh, transactions have to be authorized. So in other words, uh, unauthorized uh, uh, transactions uh, are not permitted. 
and uh, you know for instance think about uh, giving discounts to a, a payer or a patient or a physician uh, without authorization or writing off a balance that that's not authorized and that's what internal control is, is seeks to prevent secondly transactions need to be recorded so that you don't have keep two kinds of books one for the auditors and one that uh, uh, kind of looks at the world uh, the way it really is uh, and uh, so that those are two overarching controls and then the last one uh, you've already seen in the prior slide that is that every once in a while we make sure that what our records say um, agree I don't know what I'm doing here playing with my keyboard in some way yeah here we go um, every once in a while you count uh, count your inventory um, living in the Pacific Northwest and having once been a, a, an auditor as uh, I'm still a CPA but I started an audit one of the things the auditors here in the Pacific Northwest do when they audit a lumber company is they go out and count the the, the logs that's sitting in the log yard to make sh and then reconcile that to the records uh, um, kept by the by the lumber mill. Uh, and then I told you there are these more modern definitions of internal control and the organization chiefly responsible for that is. Uh, organization called COSO, um, which is a, a mouthful. You can read about it on page 124 and also what, it, uh, what its uh, compliance framework is all about. It's a document uh, more than 100 pages long uh, with fancy graphics and uh, cubes that uh, you can turn three, to three different ways to look at different dimensions of internal control. It's all beautiful, but uh, it, uh, it tells you way more than you really need to know uh, when you, if you're a practitioner in, in the field. Okay, so there's a case study here where I uh, ask uh, you some questions, uh, and the, the, these are not polling questions, so we're going to get to the polling questions in a moment, but uh, you can look at these case study problems in you your text on page, uh, starting on page 293. The one uh, on the screen here is simply the first one of those um, having to do with uh, the uh, internal control uh, objectives overall. And the, the right answer to this one is, um, uh, it's actually, I'm not sure it's the first one, it's the second question. Oh, it's one of the questions in any case. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, it's one of the questions there in the back. Sorry, I can't, I can't identify right now for you exactly which one it is. So look at what it says here: separation of cash, record keeping from custody of cash. That just kind of jumps right out of you as a an element of internal control: the segregation of duties, preparing a, a monthly. Uh, uh, bank reconciliation is an important uh, internal control function. Batch processing of checks is a good control. Uh, what that means is that you uh, total up the checks first and then uh, post to the computer the remittances and compare the two numbers to make sure they agree. And then the last one is uh, seems to be a separation of duties uh, answer, but the receipt, the separation of cash receipts from cash disbursements, there is no internal control risk there. So that's the least likely one. So D would be the right answer. So go look at those questions. There's an interesting one there, the very first one that has to do, um, a second, let me read you the question, or let's go quickly to page 193 and look at that. I'll go to the book here, go to page 193, oops, oh, I'm in the wrong place, here we go, Two hundred and ninety-three. sorry, 
here we go. Here, this very first question uh, is an interesting one. Which of the following would be least likely to be considered an objective of a system of internal control? The answer is, is this one right here, B. Uh, and uh, you might very easily be drawn exactly to that answer and, and say that that's the right answer. Why is it not? Uh, aside from the fact or the merits of the question, just look at the definitions of the others, checking the accuracy and reliability of accounting data. That was one of our four objectives of internal control, encouraging the adherence to managerial policies. You'll remember seeing that. And safeguarding of assets is also one of the four. So that kind of leaves this one out in the cold. And uh, there's a lot, uh, uh, you know, after uh, Bernie Madoff and Enron, there has been a lot of uh, um, focus on detecting fraud. But interestingly enough, it is you don't go out looking for it uh, uh, specifically, you look at risks and then depending on whether there are risks, you look for fraud, but uh, you don't just go out uh, uh, initially looking for fraud everywhere. So that's maybe a little bit of a surprise uh, that that would be the right answer there. So there's this COSO framework, like I said, and uh, uh, that's about it for internal control. We're done with internal control. And uh, that brings us now directly into a field uh, heavily uh, of heavy interest to all of us in uh, the field of healthcare. That has that's the field of compliance. So, what is compliance? First of all, it is sometimes defined, and here's a Webster's definition of it. It's defined in in terms of itself. So, this definition number one a here defines comply compliance by using the word comply in it. I prefer this one here, conformity, the conformity with something. And in our case, it's conformity with laws, it's conformity with regulations and statutes. So it's, uh, um, it's a process of adhering to something that we're required to do. Um, so we start uh, by now looking at some of the uh, elements of internal control and rather than do this from the slide here I'm going to go, go to the book which is right uh, no, I'm in the wrong place again move back to where I should be here this page 127 cough again turn myself off pardon me I'm back here um, so this set of pages here, 125 to 127. I changed a little bit this last week, and I'm going to send you the replacement pages. What I did, and you will see this here in a minute, I organized these uh, laws in chronological order. And I also um, give you more information about COBRA, which I don't really do here. And I give you more information about HIPAA, which is uh, doesn't show up here until later. I don't know. HIPAA, I don't have very much to say on here at all. And that's a shame. HIPAA, here it is. OK. So what I have done is expand this. And let me just show you the replacement pages that you're going to see. Here they are. and. Uh, I will just talk from them. So taking these things in order, I think this makes more sense. We start with the False Claims Act. Look at the year of this thing, 1863. I went to Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania and loved to, loved to ride my bike over the battlefields uh, in the evening or after class. And it was in the year of uh, the Battle of Gettysburg, which was 100 years ago this past July, that Congress passed the False Claims Act, which uh, um, was intended to um, pro, uh, punish unscrupulous vendors who sold uh, uh, defective goods to the government, to the army. And uh, this law has remained in effect. It's been changed many times since. And of course, it has a, a, a enormous applicability to 
the, the goods that uh, we sell the government and, and as evidenced by UB04 forms and 1500 claim forms, all we're selling the government all kinds of stuff, healthcare wise, and the uh, government has a keen interest in making sure that uh, we as taxpayers are only paying for for uh, conforming goods or compliant things. So this law has a whistleblower provision which uh, um, allows someone to um, be to share I think 20 or 25 percent of the proceeds from any amounts recovered by the, the government from uh, a fraudulent operator. And the um, the punishment you see is, is enormous. It's uh, triple damages, but also $11,000 per false claim on top of that. So we have to comply with this law. And uh, if we are a sanctioned individual, we're forever banned from uh, being a, a billing Medicare again. The second law is the Social Security Act of 1935. I mislabel it here by calling it uh, the Social Security Act from 1965. What happened in 1965 is that these two titles were added. Title 18, which is Medicare, and Title 19, which is Medicaid. You can already tell by the numbering system that this Title 5 has to be an older provision. It's actually one, it's an amendment from the 1930s to the Social Security Act. I want to be on this page here. Okay, so that's something we need to uh, adhere with. And then ERISA is the next uh, uh, milestone in compliance. It's the Employee Retirement and Income Security Act. This is the kind of healthcare that President Obama had in mind when he says, if you like your healthcare, you can keep it. It applies to many of us in so far as we have jobs where our employer provides insurance, health insurance, and pays for the insurance rather than insures for it and has a uh, insurance company pay for it. So most or many employers are self-insured. They might reinsure uh, high outlier cases with reinsurance policies with a high deductible. But these kinds of plans are, and this is the, the thing that's significant here, they're subject not to state regulations as all other insurance companies are, but they're exempt from uh, uh, them because they're regulated uh, for, uh, by the federal government and they're also exempt from state mandated health benefits. So if, uh, if uh, the chiropractors in uh, Illinois, let's say, uh, then the legislature's arm and say we want chiropractic chiropractic services to be a, a mandated uh, statewide insurance benefit. Uh, ERISA plans don't have to comply with that. Okay, here's the section that's a little bit longer and I hope clear. It's it's the uh, um, discussion of what Cobra is. It uh, is the there's also a tax law by the name of Cobra from the same year. It's the same act, but what it establishes, what we're interested in here, is the ability to um, continue to have uh, your health insurance after a qualifying event. Qualifying event could be a, a, a loss of your job to termination or layoff, uh, um, divorce uh, is a a qualifying event, death of a covered employee, and so forth. So you are able to continue to be insured under your old uh, employer's policy for up to 18 months if you pay both portions of the fee, the employers and the uh, employees, plus uh, sometimes a small administrative fee can be added to that. You have, and this is I think important, I had left this out, you have 60 days to make this choice after you leave the work. So here's an example. If you quit your job on December 31, got admitted to the hospital on February 15th, you didn't make a COBRA election right when you left the work, you can still retroactively make that election and pay two months worth of premium. So that's, uh, it's a, re a re retroactive way to get co coverage similar to how Medicaid coverage can be retroactive if you are hospitalized. EMTALA 
um, uh, in, think about what the initials stand for. It, it's two things. It's Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. Two different things in a way, although related. It's, it's the law that uh, prevents hospitals that have an emergency room, but only those hospitals, from dumping a patient in the street and sending them in an ambulance to the hospital elsewhere, another hospital. So if a patient presents with an emergent condition, they have a right to be seen in your emergency room. If a mother in active labor uh, steps into your emergency room, she has a right to deliver in the hospital. The text that I inserted here uh, within the last year is from HFMA's uh, Patient Financial Communications Best Practices, a document that is fabulous in its clarity. And I excerpt uh, pieces of it here. And what I will do is send you that whole document as part of uh, my, uh, um, e my email to Brad with additional stuff. Uh, there's no better exp explanation, in my opinion, of what uh, happens, what should happen in the emergency room. Uh, the, basically, the law says that you have to, you have a right to be evaluated and uh, triaged and stabilized, you don't have a right to treatment under a medical condition. So treatment in, in, a, in a sense here is, uh, isn't right. It's emergency medical uh, uh, evaluation and stabilization and active labor act. That, that should be really the, the right title of it. So that's described here for you uh, with this excerpt. Then the anti-kickback and Stark, this, these are well, I'm having a hard time uh, highlighting them. This is important stuff, and this is easy to confuse, these two types of laws. The first one has to do with uh, uh, refer uh, referrals uh, uh, to others that you then get uh, some kickback for or get rewarded for. So if, if I'm a... Um, a um, Orthopedic, a successful orthopedic surgeon. Orthopedic surgeon. I, uh, I cannot go to the hospital administrator where I, uh, I do my surgeries and say, my friend, I'm, I'm such a fi fine doctor for you, uh, uh, and uh, I need, to, I need, you need to reward me somehow for how much business I bring to your uh, hospital. That's not permitted. So um, you cannot offer or or be rewarded for referrals for any kinds of services. It also applies to employment, and this is uh, uh, something of great uh, significance right now, uh, since so many physicians are choosing to work for uh, hospitals. A hospital may not offer a a physician more than fair market value uh, compensation. Fair market value is defined by work RVUs, as you know from last week. It's not defined by how busy uh, uh, the hospital's uh, uh, surgery suite is, although those things could be related, but they cannot be tied together in that way. So that's the anti-kickback statute. Stark, and it came in two uh, installments, uh, prohibit self-referrals. That's something different. I'm the, sa the same. I'm the same orthopedic surgeon uh, from a moment ago. This time, however, I have. Uh, I also have a little MRI machine sitting down the hall, and as I write uh, orders to my patients for MRIs, I I do it on my own uh, uh, MRI. Uh, a script form and uh, I, I tell the patients to go down the hall to schedule their MRI. I can't do that. I can, however, give my patient a list of the, the, the 15 MRIs in, in, in my neighborhood and say, go to the one that's most convenient for you. If you want to have it done today right here, you can do that as well. So that's allowed, but self-referrals, uh, sort of automatic self-referrals are not permitted. Stark 1 started this process by pre uh, referring to labs. So this only involved lab. Uh, the Stark II law, uh, four years later, extended uh, the 
self-referral provision to virtually every other thing that a physician could possibly have an investment interest in, like uh, surgery centers, uh, radiology, and, and many other services. So that's what the Stark law is. It's a self-referral law. HIPAA, this is an expanded section here the, uh, from your book. It has two different, it has many different things to it. First of all, it's the only law that ever came out of the first attempt under President Clinton and Hillary Clinton to reform health care in the early 1990s. This is the only part of it that ever made it into law. It establishes an element of insurance portability in so far as if you have had creditable continuous coverage under a different insurance policy working for a, a, another employer and, and that lasted for at least a year and a half. If you switch jobs and change insurance plans, the new plan cannot exclude uh, uh, um, prior existing condition, pre-existing conditions. They are covered by the new plan. Uh, they have to be covered if you had creditable continuous coverage for at least a year and a half under another plan. This is what I added to the book and then the other thing I added is to explain what some of these administrative simplification standards are. You're familiar with them already. I'm just elaborating them for you here a little bit. And then the, of course, you will remember these uh, f from 10 years ago, the privacy and security provisions from 2003. Now, there are some twists to this that some entities are not covered. You have to be a covered entity in order to be subject to these uh, uh, transaction standards and code sets. Uh, the following insurances are not covered entities and don't have to comply with these uh, transaction sets or so e-commerce standards, accident insurance, disability, auto insurance, as well as workers' comp. Also excluded providers that don't transmit information in an electronic form. In other words, you're still allowed to send paper claims, although many payers don't allow you to do that anymore. HIPAA itself does not prohibit that. So those are some of the changes I made. The rest of this stuff is already in the in your book as before. We're going to talk more about uh, 990 stuff and, uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, and I think it's time for some polling questions. So, Shannon, let's do some polling okay. questions, please. Okay, here's the first one. Title 18 of Social Security Act refers to, and we'll give you about a minute. Okay, about 88% have voted, so we'll close that polling question. And it looks like 95% said health insurance for the aged and disabled. Oh, you are so good. Thank you. That is the right answer. Uh, just a little tidbit here on... Uh, Title V, the block grants, I told you that's one of the earlier uh, uh, amendments to the Social Security Act. It, uh, amongst its provisions, has one for uh, funding abstinence education. But you might want to know that. Okay, let's do one more polling question. Polling question number two, please, Shannon. Okay, here we go. ERISA plans are subject to both federal and state regulations. True or false? And don't forget, if you need CPE, 
that we need to answer the polling questions, please. Okay, we have 91% that voted that time, and we have 71% saying false. And that is correct. Uh, ERISA plans, ERISA is a federal law, and it preempts state law for insurance terms, uh, for purposes of insurance regulation. Thank you all, and thank you, Shannon. We will do some more polling questions in just a moment. What I wanted to talk about next uh, before moving on is to talk about the difference between fraud and abuse. You see it right here popping back up on your page. Uh, it's uh, easy to say that fraud is intentional and uh, abuse is unintentional. Uh, it might be helpful to it's, uh, elaborate a little bit on that to say that uh, in criminal cases, uh, the burden of proof is a very high one, and that is beyond reasonable doubt. So um, if there is no doubt that uh, someone intentionally tried to deceive or misrepresent facts, it is uh, fraud, uh, whereas the burden of proof in a civil case is preponderance of evidence, a lesser um, uh, level of uh, of uh, of proof, and um, but uh, both of them get pursued. And recently, I was at an HFMA meeting where both an attorney general, uh, no, he was a federal, uh, he was a federal prosecutor, and a. Um, OIG special agent uh, uh, presented uh, on fraud and abuse, and both of them showed their badges to the audience. We were, of course, quite impressed by them flashing their badges at us at the beginning when they were introduced. So that's uh, the difference between fraud and abuse. Where do we go next? I have to go back to my uh, normal presentation here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this kind of goes uh, in conjunction with what we did last week when we talked about the revenue cycle, when we were talking about OPPS. There are computer programs that uh, um, do some of this detective work, sniffing out uh, compliance issues or problems. And one of this is the outpatient prospective payment, uh, outpatient code editor, OCE. And, uh, the edits that it uh, performs are shown here. They are simply uh, listed for you here. These are edits that are specific to the outpatient code editor. Uh, also uh, in, in play come the uh, CCI edits. And we all hear about these CCI edits, but don't necessarily know very much about them. They are the coding pair edits that uh, establish medical necessity for uh, outpatient services and also for physician services. So the uh, diagnosis code, the ICD-9, soon to be ICD-10 diagnosis code, and the CPT slash HICPIC code need to be in a reasonable relationship to each other for uh, um, a uh, charge to pass the CCI edits. These are built into this uh, uh, OCE editor. These edits are just built into them, and you see how many they are. Um, then there are also um, uh, further edits that are called medically unlikely edits that 
added for other things, namely uh, uh, unreasonable units of service on a claim. They wouldn't be picked up uh, by a code pair edit. And uh, the uh, distinguishing fact here is that not all of these edits are known. Some of them are not published. And uh, uh, it is for the same reasons that the IRS doesn't publish the criteria by which it audits or picks uh, in uh, tax returns for audit. So here are just some uh, uh, example. So, for instance, you can't have more than one level one emergency visit uh, on a claim. You know that this is just an example of what a MUE edit looks like. Then, further here in the text, I I list out the various uh, uh, organizations that have a hand in in checking medical necessity and reviewing claims for compliance as well as for fraud and uh, the Medicare administrative contractors are one these are the contractors of the CMS to uh, administer the uh, Medicare A, B and D claims not the C claims though those are handled by uh, uh, private payers uh, they also are responsible for education. So they don't only pay claims, but they are also tasked with their provider reps uh, offering free education webinars, on-site training. That's all within the purview of a Medicare administrative contractors, in addition to also conducting prepayment and post-payment medical reviews of claims. For instance, if a claim gets uh, an additional development request, an ADR, and you uh, saw that on one of the slides from last week at ADR, that's typically when a medical record gets pulled, that is something part of this uh, um, prepayment or postpayment review that a con contractor, Medicare administrative contractor performs. Then there are quality improvement organizations. They used to be called something different. Um, but uh, they uh, themselves develop uh, quality measures uh, that have made it into the PQRS, uh, Physician Quality Reporting System. These are private, mostly not-for-profit state-level organizations that they used to be called PROs, Professional Review Organizations. Now they are called uh, QIOs. Then there is a, another uh, initiative that looks for the error rate. And the error rate is pretty high. You'll see that here on uh, this page, just how high the error rate for claims is. And these two uh, uh, people who talked at the HFMA meeting I recently attended in Seattle were saying how many billions of dollars a year are recovered as a result of what uh, these review organizations do. And this CERT organization is, is a key piece of that. We're familiar with the RACs, we'll need to talk about them. Then there are also uh, uh, outfits called the ZIPIX that particularly look for fraud. They um, look for other things than what uh, uh, we normally um, are doing because we're mainly looking for abuse or negligence. And then the OIG publishes an audit program every year or a work plan as it is called where they uh, announce what it is they're going to be looking at uh, in the coming year. So those are all of the review organizations and I just simply give you some more information here on the two uh, components of compliance that to me are the most easily confused and uh, mixed up and uh, are are so important in our healthcare environment, which is self-referrals, the anti-kickback, the Stark Law, I'm careful what I'm saying, and then the anti-kickback statute, which looks at uh, rewards for referrals. So I think it's time for uh, some more polling questions before we go into um, compliance guidance here. So Shannon, would you show us um, the next couple of questions, please? Sure. 
answer the third question. Under EMTALA, providers are permitted to About 15 more seconds. Okay, we have about 88% in. And it looks like 81% say collect insurance information after patients have been stabilized. Yes, and that is the right answer. Um... Thank you very much. Uh, Shannon will show us, go right into the next question, please, which is uh, a question on HIPAA. In 1996, HIPAA About 15 more seconds. Okay, 92% in and 79% say established insurance portability. Yes, that is correct. Uh, to B can't be the right answer because uh, the electronic standards for cash payments are, uh, or ACH standards are developed by somebody else and I couldn't tell you who that is, maybe the American Bankers Association, I'm not sure. And uh, the standards that exist, claims and remittance standards have existed before HIPAA it's uh, just that HIPAA baked them in and uh, made them mandatory. These standards are developed by uh, groups that are uh, industry groups, and uh, the, um, the law then simply adopts them and, and sanctions them. So thank you, Shannon. Thank you, audience. All right. Um, we are now going to talk about compliance guidance for hospitals. In 19, between 1997 and 2003, the OIG published uh, voluntary compliance program guidance for all, for all, really all types of provider organizations, starting with hospitals, labs, uh, uh, surgery centers, many other uh, provider types have separate guidance as well. They're all very similar to each other. There's essentially copy and paste uh, from one standard to another. They, uh, at, up to this time, have been optional or voluntary. However, under the ACA, I'm not sure if this provision has gone into effect. I don't think it has. Uh, the compliance programs are mandatory. And there are either seven or eight different uh, standards or elements to them. Initially there were seven and in the more recent uh, uh, literature there are eight. So these are things that you are all familiar with from uh, your organizations. Uh, the compliance officer and a compliance committee, ongoing training, monitoring, uh, etc. All of this uh, 
has become second nature to us. The last one to be added to this, the eighth one, simply uh, excludes sanctioned individuals. So if you are, if you have uh, been excluded uh, from the Medicare program, uh, you can't be hired, uh, look for a new job someplace else because your new employer is going to have to look at the, the database to, 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 to check on that and uh, um, decline from hiring you. So that is an eighth standard that has been added. Okay, so okay, here I say they have to be in place by 2010, but I haven't really read very much about this, so I'm not sure if this is really true. Okay, so here are um, eight of these, uh, and, and the one that I just talked about is this one here. This is the, the, the one that isn't in the earlier list of seven. It's the non-delegation of authority to those with a propensity to criminal acts. So here are just, I, I'm just listing what last year was in the work plan and, uh, you know, provider organizations then uh, adapt their own compliance programs, their internal control systems to make sure that they are compliant in, in the things that the OIG is looking at. So that's uh, what uh, all there is to, to talk about compliance in, in the sense of complying with these different regulations and laws. Now we have to talk a little bit about the cost report. And Martha uh, helped me a great deal with this last year, um, as, as have others in, in Oregon, because I don't prepare cost reports and um, am uh, just as un, unknowledgeable as anybody else. But I've taught myself about what cost reports are by putting this material together and knowing more specifically how they are prepared and what's in them. So I put here on one page, it actually spills over into the next page a little bit, everything you need to know about a cost report without actually looking at a cost report. So I encourage you to read this and why am I talking about this? There are there were four or five questions on my exam and other people have confirmed since that, that the cost report has shown up on all of their exams as well. So this is important material for purposes of the exam. Um, and uh, on the next page here, this was not on my exam, but uh, uh, figuring that uh, we might as well learn some things that we might not necessarily know. We all hear about Medicare disproportionate share or DISH as it's pronounced, but few people know exactly how it is computed. And so here I'm giving you the formula. You don't need to remember this. It's just very interesting to know how it works. And that also that there are uh, uh, some changes to this that have significantly reduced DISH payments. So it's been in the news more uh, in the last year. Then graduate med medical education and indirect medical education followed their own rules and uh, what is interesting is to see how much CMS pays per resident. Now this is not how much residents as you know get paid a year but uh, uh, CMS uh, funds residents uh, uh, and uh, you know there's a lot of training and supervision included in, in this cost that CMS pays. It's not just the paycheck the residents, residents take home. And then there's indirect medical education as well. Again, these are uh, supplement, supplemental topics uh, included here just for your edification and enjoyment. Now here I, in next in the book, I'm showing you actually what a cost report looks like. And then there's a case study on a cost report. Why am I doing this? Well, there are questions having to do with the actual content of a cost report. And since many of us, uh, Martha I know prepares the prepares cost reports for a living professionally, most of us don't get to see these things and know what is in them and know how valuable the information is. Essentially, a cost report is a a, a cost accounting system. It's a way to um, look at and report
report information about a provider in a standard way that allows us uh, to look at what things actually cost. The title page looks like this. You see uh, on it uh, a place for the administrator to sign and attest to its accuracy. And then you see the titles here, Title 5, 18, and 19 show up. And the most important line on a cost report by far is this one, line 200, where uh, the cost, where we report to CMS what we think we owe CMS back due to CMS would go into this box or what CMS owes us would go here. And then Medicare uh, audits, cost reports, that's one of the functions that Medicare administrative contractors perform. And uh, it then comes down to a settlement and uh, uh, these, these things can drag out for a long, long time. I just want to show you how this information shows up on a uh, financial statement. I'm going back to the financial statements here in the front of the book and notice, you maybe remember this from our discussion from webinar one on uh, HFMA health systems, financial systems, there was a line for payable to contractual agencies, this line right here. That's the line that uh, is tied to the, the cost report. These are what we estimate we owe to the uh, contractual agencies. If they owe us money, it would be shown as a current uh, asset rather than a current liability, obviously. So back to the worksheets here. Uh, then there are sheets here that basically identify the provider and give uh, basic information. And you will remember from our earlier discussion when we talked about patient days, uh, and discharges, that's information that's entered here in this worksheet S3. More information uh, after that, and then we come to this worksheet B. This is uh, uh, the, the, the fun part, I think, of a cost report. I don't know if Martha would agree with that. I'm going to show you what this worksheet would look like if filled out uh, with imaginary numbers, it would look like this. It's a pretty big thing. And notice there's this uh, stair-step pattern here. Just to um, I can make it a little bit bigger here for you. OK, I'll make it even bigger. 200. Yes, notice that it uh, uh, um, in the left column here, it has all of the different cost centers. It starts with the overhead departments. These are all of the overhead departments. If you look at the line items, dietary, housekeeping, cafeteria, those are not revenue producing departments. Those are overhead departments. Administration is in here. The CEO is in here. The CFO, um, the accounting department. And so this hospital here has $22 million of overhead just in these cost centers. That is out of total costs of 46 million down here. So you see that almost half is overhead. The rest is uh, in revenue producing departments, either inpatient, these are here, or ancillary, this is outpatient. So these are the departments that the, the costs ultimately need to be allocated to, but you don't start with that, you first in the order of priority, allocate overhead costs to other overhead departments. You do that in this stair step manner. So the four and a half million here of uh, new buildings and fixtures is split uh, amongst uh, all of these other overhead departments. And then the remainder of it is split among these uh, revenue producing departments, all based on a formula of square feet and so forth and so on. And as you move to the right, eventually all of the overhead costs disappear from this overhead section above. They're all gone and they are now down here in these revenues producing departments. And you see in this last column that $46 million shows up again, but it's now all down here in these revenue producing departments. What you can then do 
having done that, having allocated your costs in, in that way, you can set them next to charges because charges we have, we, you know, we uh, uh, charge for all of these things we do down here. So we can compare the cost to the charges. And then in our last column here, compute a ratio of costs to charges. And you see in some cases, that's uh, very, very low. So for this first department, I have to go look and see what that is for operating room. Uh, only 15% of my uh, charges are actually costs. The rest is uh, just our charge structure in, in our healthcare system. So that's how this allocation of uh, or this particular worksheet in the cost report works. Something that I think uh, we all should know and admire uh, when others do it well. Uh, then we compute the ratio of cost to charges. We've already seen how that works on, on my illustration here, the costs, here the charges. And then we have some other uh, sheets here in the cost report. Pay close attention, please. We have an entire financial statement as part of a cost report. Not that you would expect to see it there, but it is. Uh, except it follows a specific order and chart of accounts that may be different from the uh, financial statements, uh, including the ones for HFMA hospital we were just looking at uh, in, on the yellow liabilities side a moment ago. So this is basically a prescribed a chart of accounts in which uh, CMS wants hospitals or uh, providers, not just hospitals, to um, to show their their balance sheet and not just their balance sheet, but then here's balance sheet continue this is liabilities, also the statement of changes in fund balances, and the income statement. All of this is there in the cost report, and then this is what Martha helped me with a year ago. The there is a system called the provider statistical and reimbursement system. Uh, these are, you, you log into a website and uh, um, pull down the information that Medicare has collected from you. What have you built Medicare in the period that you choose to pull down this report from in, in uh, charges by these different revenue codes. So this ought to reconcile with your own records of what you build. So that's what a, a PSNR report looks like. That's what this is abbreviated as. And then you can also then uh, see the further breakout. Um, uh, in this case, it's just for outpatient OPPS. So that's how that works. Now let's do some more polling questions while we're, uh, before we go to the next section. So Shannon, show us the next polling question number five. Okay. We have entities covered under HIPAA include Okay, we have about 10 more seconds. Okay, with 89% having voted, we have entities covered under HIPAA include 51% said clearing houses. That is the right answer. Yes, clearing houses are uh, covered entities. Um, providers who send paper claims are not, and uh, workers' comp plans also are not uh, covered entities under HIPAA. 
and you remember what clearing houses are from our discussion last week. They are the traffic cops between the payers and the providers. Shannon, will you show us the next question number six, please? Okay. The difference between Stark 1 and Stark 2 consists of seconds. Okay. And we have 45% saying one prohibits self-referrals two paying for referrals, and 44% saying one covers lab referrals, two adds other health services. Wow, that's a, that's a close call right there. The right answer is C, and uh, you don't need to even know the difference between start one and two precisely in order to uh, get this one right, because A, which is what uh, half of the class practically answered is confusing the Stark law with the anti-kickback statute. Uh, Stark covers self-referrals, uh, referring to an entity you own, whereas uh, the anti-kickback statute um, prohibits payment for referrals, receiving payment or paying someone else for a referral. So that's the anti-kickback statute. And then just uh, um, Stark 1 does cover lab referrals, talking about B right now, so that is correct. But, uh, um, and I didn't talk about this, uh, so this gives me an opportunity to mention it. Uh, In-office ancillaries are uh, exempt from self-referrals. So if the doctor uh, orders uh, or wants you to come in fasting and do a uh, urine analysis uh, in the in the morning before a physical that is not a self-referral to uh, an owned lab because it's just a tiny little lab with a phlebotomist there in the corner of your office and that's part of providing patient care the same would be to do a chest x-ray in an exam room where they roll in the machine or an EKG. You're not referring to an entity that you own. You're just providing patient care right there in the office. So those things are exempt from the self-referral law. So thank you very much for answering those questions. Now the last compliance topic we need to talk about is 990 reporting. That is a, a tax return or an information return uh, filed with the IRS uh, for, by all organizations exempt from income taxes, not-for-profit organizations. In other words, there are many uh, sections to this particular code and uh, the one that applies to hospitals is uh, the, the 501c3 piece of it which uh, um, includes all organizations that operate for any of these or uh, purposes. Charitable are hospitals, religious would be churches, temples, uh, uh, mosques, synagogues, uh, worship centers. Educational would be uh, colleges and universities. Uh, scientific would be organizations like the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and so forth and so on. Uh, these organizations uh, have to file these kinds of returns and we'll look at what the return actually looks like in just a minute because again most of us have never seen a 990 just as we haven't seen a cost report. 
there is something specific to um, uh, not-for-profit organizations that we need to concern ourselves with, and that is that uh, not-for-profit organizations are not completely exempt from income tax. Insofar as they have unrelated business income, they have to pay taxes. And why is that? Uh, the, it does not make sense from a social policy perspective to allow a not-for-profit organization to compete with for-profit organizations. Uh, for instance, we in Portland, Oregon used to have a uh, YMCA with a fantastic, beautiful um, uh, exercise facility, every bit as nice as uh, LA Fitness or 24-hour fitness and they lost their tax exemption because they were competing with these uh, for-profit uh, uh, organizations. So uh, where do we compete in, in healthcare with for-profit organizations? We do in so far as we have a retail pharmacy, not a pharmacy that fills uh, 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 orders for inpatients or outpatients, but one where you can walk in and uh, uh, fill a prescription like you would at uh, CVS or Walgreens. Uh, insofar as we do lab testing on referred specimens where we would be competing with uh, Quest, for instance, and Brad uh, Adams can tell us more about that. He works for Vanderbilt University's uh, labs. And then also for uh, uh, some real estate, if we, if we use debt to finance the medical office building and use uh, tax exempt debt, we also have to pay taxes on that rental income. However, if it's financed with uh, without debt, then that doesn't apply. So here are the main things that are excluded and they're quite a bit. Gift shop, cafeteria, parking, those are the kind of things you would think you would be paying taxes on, but you're not because they are substantially related to the exempt purpose in that you have to uh, uh, be able to sell gift cards to uh, visitors and feed them and allow them a place to park. So that is uh, the Schedule T and then Schedule H has uh, uh, some other requirements and we will see what those are when we look at the schedules here in a moment. So here is uh, an um, image of a 990T and notice down here is the section on UBI or unrelated trade or business income where you have to show what your profit is then you have to list your expenses and show what your net is and that you have to then pay taxes on. Here is the front cover, the title page so to speak of a 990 form. Again it gives you, lists your uh, uh, identifying information just like a, your own personal income tax return would and then below that is a section, a blank section where you can brag a little bit and talk about how wonderful you are and uh, when other organizations, and this is public information that other anybody can download off the internet so you ought to take pride in, in the good work that you do and, and say so here in that section. Then this next section, or the section seven, I'm skipping some sections here. This section seven is uh, frequently the source of uh, newspaper articles and investigative journalism that fingers uh, CEOs and other highly paid individuals by showing how much money they make. That's reported in this part seven. Then I'm showing you here that where HFMA falls, HFMA, our own professional association, consists of two components and this was actually tested once on the exam. Uh, it wasn't on my most recent exam, but uh, heck, someone can always find uh, material even in this section to ask questions on. So HFMA consists of an educational foundation that organizes webinars and the a and i and so forth and then and it consists of a uh, trade association that has a representation in washington dc that uh, uh, advocates on behalf of our industry in in the political arena and then and i'm showing you what some of the other organizations are and last year you heard a lot about 501c4 organizations so they're 
one of them. And this list is by no means complete. There are more categories of tax exemption. And then here, just to show you that HFMA also pays income taxes, it pays taxes on its uh, advertising revenue. So that's a pretty big chunk of money that HFMA uh, gets every year from sponsorship revenue. Here's the Schedule H, the newest uh, schedule in this se section of uh, schedules. This one is, I think, from the late 2000s, I don't know, maybe 2007 or 8, it came into being. It came into being as a result of uh, in, uh, journalism uh, investigation into hospitals that were um, kicking people out of their homes when they couldn't pay their hospital bills. So now the IRS wants to know: Do you have a financial assistance policy, and what are the criteria, and then how do you uh, administer? Below that is a very nice section for more bragging in a way where you can list in dollars and cents how much charity care you give. It's right here, financial assistance at cost. Remember from webinar one, uh, we report charity care at cost and we use the ratio of cost to charges from the cost report we were looking at a minute ago to determine what those costs are unless we have another way of doing figuring out what our costs are. Then we list on here, oops, also our Medicare short, Medicaid shortfall. Medicaid doesn't always pay costs. We all are aware of that. And insofar as we are paid less than cost, we are providing a community benefit. That does not apply to Medicare because Medicare is not a means tested program. It, as you know from the uh, polling question number one, it is health insurance for the aged and disabled. So many, the Medicare shortfall is not a community benefit. And then there are the community benefits that you can list here. And then there are some things that are not community benefits that are listed in yet another section. So what are examples of other community benefits? I had fun with this one, finding this information in a uh, publication I picked up at UCLA. So if you have a, go to a class in hair loss or hair restoration, and the hospital can list that as a community benefit. Okay, that figures uh, out, uh, that ends our conversation about uh, um, compliance and it's possible that the tax exemption for hospitals at some point will go away, but not for a while as uh, more and more Americans are covered by insurance. Uh, the, the question is, is tax exemption still a meaningful social uh, benefit that we grant our hospitals? Okay, so we now are moving into the next topic, which is uh, contract management. And I promised you we're going steeply downhill here in these various topics and I think they get easier and easier. This is uh, one that is uh, also covered in the, I'm going to show you again what the cover of it looks like right here. This is if you wanted to read about it in the online study guide. It's an hour and a half section and we are only talking about uh, parts one and two here and, and, and even that only ever so briefly. We're not going to talk about evaluating contracts or operationalizing and monitoring them. That is uh, uh, fluff material that we don't need to concern ourselves with. So let's talk about these two different things, contracts 101 and common contracts in healthcare, and what it is we have to talk about there. I'll skip forward a little bit here and uh, take you to page uh, 163. We're going to come back to the pages I just skipped in a moment. So at this page, I explain to you what the elements of a valid contract are. You will remember this from your contracts, commercial contracts class in college or graduate school. You may have also run into this uh, on the CPA exam or in, in, in some other, in MBA classes possibly as well under commercial law. So there are four elements to establishing a, a valid contract. And if, un, unless 
all four of these elements are present, you don't have a valid contract. The first one is assent that uh, uh, both parties uh, agree on something. Consideration is the second one that there is something of value that uh, is exchanged uh, in consideration for the uh, service or the product offered. Capacity, this is the one of interest to us in healthcare. Uh, a contract does not exist if one of the parties doesn't have uh, capacity. So minors, drunkards, and the mentally ill cannot enter into a contract. And I don't know where this somewhat outdated language comes from, but uh, so it is. And uh, if a minor is emancipated, as you could picture someone like Justin Bieber, uh, be he's too old for that now, but uh, he, he once he turned 16, uh, he theoretically could have as, um, told his parents, I don't need you and your money anymore, I'm on my own, or they could have kicked him out of the nest and made him an emancipated minor. So Justin Bieber, between the age of uh, 16 and 18, can walk into the hospital and sign the financial responsibility agreement and all the other agreements uh, that uh, you sign in admitting or registration as an emancipated minor. But someone who is under the age of 16 or not emancipated has not the capacity to enter into a contract. And legality just simply means that you can't issue a contract on your neighbor because he plays loud music uh, at night. So that's an unenforceable contract. That's all we need to talk about when it comes to Contracts 101. Um, so what is left to talk about with contracts um, is um, uh, is evaluating a contract, okay? Ah, and uh, I need to just go there. It's page 164, so I just skipped it. Here we go. And here's a section on emancipated minors for you explaining what I just was summarizing. Okay, so boilerplate provisions in contracts. There's certain things that every contract needs to have. Um, and uh, this is from the online study guide, so I'm nearly using that information here, but uh, using my own definitions of what each of these things mean. Significant among all of these uh, is this one right here, severability of agreement. And let me tell you why. In 2012, you will remember this well, in the summer, uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that the individual mandate is constitutional and that it's okay to charge uninsured or pay, patients who choose not to carry insurance a penalty. Uh, had the, the Supreme Court struck down the individual mandate, it would have invalidated the entire ACA. Why? Because the drafters of the ACA in 2010 forgot to add a severability clause to the ACA. All right, so it shows you why, why this stuff actually matters. And then there's some other contract uh, boilerplate provisions described here. Then there are um, some things that are specific to a, a provider contract that are fr frequently, or that really need to be spelled out in the contract language, and those are listed here. Again, this is something from the online study guide. And I, I'm only going to talk about some of the, uh, them here because they're interesting and also because they could show up on the exam. It's the concept of subrogation, what it is and uh, how it works. It is um, from the Latin word to put yourself in the place of another or, or to be in a place of substitution uh, in the place of another. I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say I, uh, as happened to me a year ago, I was hit on Interstate 5 from behind by an uninsured driver. 
or some damage to my car, my insurance, since I have uninsured coverage, paid for the claim, and uh, I, I only had to pay my deductible. Well, I was uh, uh, injured, I wasn't physically injured, but I, um, you know, the other driver caused damage uh, to my vehicle and really was liable. So what my insurance did is sue this uninsured uh, mother of two uh, with her kids in the back seat and uh, uh, who didn't have a driver's license and didn't have uh, insurance and uh, was never able to recover. But you see under subrogation, that's what the insurance company could do is go after another party, uh, which I otherwise would have had the right to do because the insurance paid the claim and uh, was trying to recover what they paid me. So that's what subrogation is. Liens, uh, I'm going to skip, you can read about liens. Here's an example of what a lien actually looks like and what it says. And then let's talk briefly though about coordination of benefits, which is something that uh, a good payer contract also talks about in its specific clauses. It governs who pays what if there's more than one insurance. Here's a very nice table that shows what happens if there's no COB and we're talking about a $10,000 claim here. Insurance A has a benefit payable of $7,600. The claim then goes to insurance B. They have a benefit payable as if they were primary of $5,700 completely ignoring the fact that payer A already paid. So just alone from the insurance A and B, the total comes to 13,300. That doesn't even include what the patient might pay. And the patient in this case wouldn't own, owe anything because already more had been paid than the original bill. So this is what uh, coordination of benefits is trying to avoid. So there's two ways uh, payers do that. One is a standard COB, the other one is a carve out. Of the two, the carve out is the more common these days. The standard uh, COB means that insurance A pays at 7,600, just like it did before. Insurance B takes the benefit of insurance A into consideration and excludes it and then pays the rest. So that uh, again, 10,000, the entire 10,000 here gets paid, not more not less, the entire 10,000. Now insurances have wised up to this and uh, said, no, we are not gonna do it that way. So insurance A pays 7,600. Insurance B in this particular case says, well, if I had been primary, I would have only paid 5,700 uh, according to my policy. And since uh, uh, insurance A paid more than I would have paid, I'm not gonna pay anything. So all that it gets paid by insurance is the 7,600. Now, if insurance B had a normal liability higher than 7,600, there would have been you know, a couple hundred extra dollars maybe paid on that claim. So that's how coordination of benefits works. And who is behind all of this? It's the NAIC, that's the National Association of insurance commissioners. Those are the guys that regulate insurance at the state level. And they uh, basically say, this is how um, how this is ought to work. And here are some of their rules. Six of them are listed here, including the one that sometimes uh, uh, people refer to as the birthday rule. This is a tidbit, another tidbit out of healthcare finance. Uh, so these are the rules and uh, there are more rules than this and uh, I'm just giving you the most uh, relevant or important ones, easiest to understand ones here. Okay, so then I show you how, how Medicare works and then I told you uh, I there is one other topic that I inc inserted here and uh, I need to go back and talk about that right here before we call it a day on this topic. And that is the topic of managed care organizations that doesn't really fit any place, uh, but it's on the exam. And so I simply uh, housing, housing it here under the contract section 
of the curriculum. So what are we talking about here? Some things that are old hat to you and we don't need to spend very much time on at all. What is an HMO? I'm kind of giving you a textbook definition here. It's kind of nice to sometimes refer to a, uh, you know, a, a written definition. This one comes from a couple of sources on the internet, including MGMA. And then we all know what a provider preferred provider organization is, but again, just for sake of completeness, I'm giving you a definition of it here. Also then defining point of service plans and exclusive provider organization, something that uh, we don't have very much of here in where I live, but maybe you do and uh, uh, work with these and live with them every day. Silent PPOs um, are not really PPOs. They are uh, uh, ways in which uh, some PPOs uh, try to save uh, patients and uh, payers money by uh, claiming to fall under the contract of uh, someone else and uh, use their prices and, and there are ways in which uh, you can make sure that something like that doesn't happen to you can be uh, hurt your profitability significantly unless uh, you have a good mechanism to fight against silent PPOs. Then managed care practice models. These are important and uh, uh, sometimes not all that easy to distinguish. There's essentially four or five of them. Uh, staff model HMOs and group model HMOs are a little bit hard to tell apart. So make sure you understand what the difference uh, uh, amongst them are. The, in the case of a staff model, there's employed physicians. In the group model, they are not employed physicians. Uh, Kaiser Permanente is actually a group model where one group, namely the HMO, contracts with the hospital uh, and uh, uh, they work together uh, in, in the marketplace. So that's what uh, a group model is. Then an IPA is merely a contracting vehicle. It is not a managed care organization insofar as it manages care in any way, shape, or form. It's just a contracting vehicle. And then there's a network model as well. Not trying, try, not trying to leave it at that. There are some other topics here um, worth mentioning corporate practice of medicine, any willing provider are two of them. Capitation, you can expect, however, for sure on the exam, whereas these other two, maybe not. What is capitation? How does it work? You know what it is. It's defined for you here. They involve, uh, capitation involves a concept called incurred but not reported, uh, which is the reason why so many payers have such short timely filing limits, sometimes 30 days, 60 or 90 days. They want to know how many claims are out there so that at the end of the year they can close their books and determine how profitable they were or how much money they lost. And they can only do that if they, if they have received all of the claims that, that have been incurred. So that's what the title literally means, incurred but not reported. The care has been provided, but the claim hasn't arrived yet. So that is something that also is very uh, a, a currently important topic when it comes to accountable care organizations. And here's a diagram from a recent article which shows you how a provider income statement uh, and an ACO income statement would relate. And, and notice this IBNR down here in the bottom right. So this is important to understand. All right, that's the end of uh, the topic of contracting. And uh, we have now uh, gone through all of this except for the quality section of this book. And uh, I'm going to skip that because I, I can't vouch for how much of this is on the exam. But if you want to dig into what uh, all of this means 
uh, in more detail and understand that I encourage you to read this. First of all, how is quality measured? There's four different ways. Uh, actually, I'm listing more of them here, but there's really four different ways in which it typically is measured. And here I discuss what CMS measures and uh, how the physician value modifier works, something brand new that hasn't gone into effect yet. But uh, take a look at this because some of this is already uh, in force under P PQRS. Some of this is already happening today, how the 1500 form is being used to report quality information. Then I have, an, I think, a very interesting section here on risk adjustment and the three methods of risk adjustment. Uh, DRGs, MSDRGs is the one most common uh, to us, which, uh, as you know from last week, pays by a resource. Uh, it's a resource-based payment system, uh, and it is uh, the distinguishing mark of it is, is that it um, sometimes amongst among DRGs uh, uh, distinguishes between three severity levels: a base DRG, one with complications and comorbidities. It's called CC or one with major complications and comorbidities called MCCs. And there's a big difference in how much uh, Medicare reimbursements reverses depending on which uh, severity level you are in. And, and notice that the word severity shows up in the title of MSDRGs as well. So this is a form of a risk adjustment where risk is how sick is the patient and uh, how should we reward a provider for taking care of that sick patient. Then there is the APA DRG system, which is a proprietary system to 3M. And it distinguishes between uh, four levels of severity of illness and four levels of mortality. And uh, one answer is how sick is the patient. The other one is what are the chances the patient will die. This is very interesting and I encourage you to look at that. There's also a fascinating case study at the end that shows you how to evaluate uh, outcomes against uh, uh, expect actual outcomes against expected outcomes and this is how health grades and uh, US News and World Report uh, measure uh, the quality of hospitals. So if you see a big banner uh, uh, in on the, along the freeway, you know, we're one of the, the five best hospitals, the hundred best hospitals, that's all based on an analysis or frequently, or much of it is based on uh, analysis of this kind of data and how you can work with that data the, the same way colleges and universities work with uh, the data that rank them. Hospitals have figured out how to, how to make themselves look good and of course also provide good care. And then uh, there's another risk adjustment method for specific to Medicare Advantage plans, Medicare Part C plans, uh, one that is very, uh, uh, un mostly unknown to many people in healthcare finance because we don't work in this arena and that is hierarchical condition categories or HCCs that essentially boil down uh, all the kinds of things that could be wrong with a patient to only a small number of diagnostic groups and then further break it down to 189 uh, condition categories. Uh, and then CMS pays the Medicare C uh, insurers or providers based on how sick the population is. That is measured off uh, claims and um, uh, is one of the reasons why it's so important for physicians to list all of the diagnoses of their patients at least once a year on one claim form. Otherwise, CMS comes to the conclusion that a quadriplegic patient from last year suddenly can walk again because that diagnosis that was missing off a claim uh, in the current year and uh, the, the Payer, the uh, the Medicare C plan, 
then receives a much lower uh, a capitation payment for that patient because uh, they, they're no longer uh, paralyzed. That's an extreme example, but it shows how this stuff matters. And uh, then there's a discussion here on how measure, how me uh, mortality gets measured and then how health grades uses that information and how HHS uses this information on the hospital compare website that you should definitely take a look at and look up your own hospital. I end this section here with a table that shows you the four general headings under which care, quality of care generally is reported these days as under as, as either outcome, process, safety, or patient experience. And what's amazing about this chart is just how many standards exist. Just look at these amazing numbers. There's 700 NQF endorsed quality standards. You yourself can propose one to NQF and have it endorsed, and then there'll be a 701 such standards. Okay, moving on now to our last topic, which is disbursements. And uh, before we go there, let's do our last two polling questions, please. Thank you. Medicare Part A pays for? Fifteen more seconds. Okay, we have Medicare Part A pays for sixty four percent said inpatient facility and physician services. And that is not the right answer. The right answer is C. Okay, why is that the right answer? Uh, even if you know nothing about hospice services, it's something we haven't talked about at all. Uh, it's somewhere in this book, I, I say that hospice is under part A, but let's say you missed that or forgot it. Just look at A, answer A and answer B, and uh, uh, see if those are true. We all know, and Nobody really here said that, that Medicare A pays uh, for inpatient services. So outpatient care is definitely the, not the right answer. But uh, Medicare A does not pay for inpatient and facility services. It only pays for inpatient services. And then, you know, hospice care and, and, and some other stuff like that. Physician services are always paid under Part B, always. Now, in the past, there were different organizations that paid claims. Uh, uh, fiscal intermediaries or FIs paid uh, inpatient claims and outpatient claims. They paid part A and part B claims with the exception of the physician services. Those were paid uh, by carriers and uh, physician services are part B services. So the part B program of Medicare was split in terms of its administration and payment between fiscal intermediaries for the inpatient side and carriers for the physician side. That's been done away with and now the uh, uh, CMS has contracted with a smaller number of contractors that and they all handle uh, A and all of Part B in, in one organization. Let's do the last question, please. Question number eight about the cost report. Okay. The step-down calculation on the Medicare cost report, Worksheet B, Part 1.
I'm not sure uh, Brad had to abbreviate this one significantly in order to fit it into the question in, into the space. So let me uh, pull up the questions here and let me read read you what the full text of the choices are. Unfortunately, you won't be able to see this because you're looking at this polling question right now. Uh, so the full question or the, the choices A and B read as follows. A allocates general service overhead costs first to inpatient, ancillary, and outpatient service cost centers, then to other general service cost centers. That's what the, the, the long version of A is. The long version of B is allocates general service overhead costs first to general service cost centers, then to inpatient, ancillary, and outpatient service centers. So the question here is, in what order uh, is the allocation first to other uh, um, other uh, overhead cost centers and then to revenue producing cost centers, or is it the other way around? First to revenue producing ones and then to overhead ones. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the poll. And it looks like the majority of people, 60%, said allocates overhead costs first to inpatients and ancillary, then outpatient cost centers. And that's actually not the right answer. It's the other, it's the other one. But I, I can't blame you uh, for being confused because you couldn't see. There's no way to show you unfortunately, in the limited space of, uh, of uh, the go-to polling question format, a complete answer. So just to recapitulate, and uh, Shannon, if you close that screen, I have since pulled up the full question here for you, and I'll just walk through that another time for you. OK, so in the cost report, you start with uh, overhead departments and then you go to the um, inpatient uh, ancillary and outpatient service cost centers rather than to allocate first the revenue cost centers and then the other overhead cost centers and you remember seeing this diagram a little while ago so first I allocate in the order uh, order of uh, uh, procedure to other overhead departments and once and, and then what's left goes to these revenue producing departments and I, I work my way down until everything is gone uh, first absorbing costs by other overhead departments and then absorbing the rest of it to the revenue side uh, revenue producing departments so that's how that works and thank you for your responses on uh, that last question. Okay, we're coming now really down to the easiest and uh, last topic, which has to do with disbursements. What do we mean by disbursements? And I'm going to show you the screen here from the study guide. Okay, it covers uh, a, a grab bag of different topics, materials management, payroll, and accounts payable. That doesn't tell me very much. So I'm trying to pick out the quantitative topics out of this, this list. And uh, the quantitative topics are essentially twofold. They are, you see it here, uh, inventory valuation, and secondly, staffing. Now, in order to complete this section, I also put in an, an, um, a lengthy discussion here of the Fair Labor Standards Act and uh, how you calculate over time correctly under the FLSA. I do that merely because in our healthcare environment where we, for instance, pay nurses uh, by complicated contracts that may include uh, a shift differential if they work nights or evenings or weekends or a, a differential for 
working uh, for going from one unit to another and and, and a different uh, uh, hourly rate uh, applies to a different unit that they're working in or they uh, get paid for working double shifts back to back so the the rate at which a nurse gets paid varies during a, a week or can vary during a week or pay period and uh, in order to calculate over time correctly, you have to take an, a weighted average of all of those uh, different rates and then take 50% of that and add it uh, to it to calculate to determine the overtime. If you just take the nurse's uh, regular, uh, regular uh, standard rate and uh, times it uh, uh, by one and a half, you come up with an answer that is that is not correct and, and is not in conformity or compliance with the Fair Labor Standards Act. So that's what that last section is about. So then let's talk about the two sections that do show up on the exam. And the first one is inventory valuation. And uh, by the way, just to let you know, someone recently told me I had a, a mistake here. And indeed I do. I described the last in first out method incorrectly as last in first out. So make that change, please, on this page. This is page 182. I apologize for that. But you don't need to, as far as I know, as far as I know, know the difference between FIFO. Well, maybe you need to know what it stands for, but you don't need to do the calculation. I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Although this is the inventory method that, uh, according to the footnotes, the HFMA health system works. So for exam purposes, I think you should know this one here, the weighted average method. So how does it work? Here's the data that we, that all of these examples apply to. And then down below is how, it, how it's used. So we bought 2,000, uh, uh, items at four dollars at the beginning of the month we bought we bought another six thousand at a slightly higher price the middle of the month we then used four thousand on the 19th and we're ending up with uh, and, and we bought another two thousand at, at a third price at the end of the month we were left at the end of the month with six thousand we started the month with nothing this is a very hip hypothetical problem uh, only to illustrate how this method works. So that's my situation. If I were going by uh, the specific identification method of valuing inventory, I would specifically identify when I pick an item off the shelf, which bin I'm taking it out of, and uh, price the piece accordingly, and then count what's left and price those pieces at their at their values or their, their unit cost. The weighted average dispenses with that and instead it uh, figures out an average or weighted average cost of all of the purchases during the month, whether it be $4, 440 or 415 uh, and uh, determines what the average or weighted average cost is. You do that by adding up all of the total costs, which I do here, it's the total of all of these three purchases. I divide it by the total number of purchases, and that's how I come up with my weighted average. And then I can price my ending inventory at that, at that weighted average cost. I can also value the items used at that same weighted average cost. Now here on this next page, I repeated that same dumb mistake again page 183, so cross that one out, please, also and replace it by last in, first out. If you really want to know how those methods work, these examples uh, show you how, how, the, how to do the calculation. Now, staffing, easy topic, um, definition of an FTE, you know what an FTE is. You also know what a paid, a productive, and a non-productive FTE is. Just to illustrate the relationship of uh, the one to the other, here's a little table that reconciles the three, the, the two, the paid and the productive FTE, by uh, either looking at the uh, days per month, the days per year, or in these last three columns in terms of hours, hours per day, hours per month, 
more hours per year. If you know how to convert from one to the other, either up, either uh, uh, vertically or horizontally, I think you will be fine when it comes to the exam. There's a very nice case study in the back where you're asked to figure out how to staff a, a call center. Um, so that's a very realistic example actually from a client where I did some work and uh, you can use this to figure out uh, staffing needs in an area where you work at as well. So here I'm just taking issue with something in the study guide and then I talk about overtime. I'm going to skip all of that and end the class until we meet again next week by simply referring to you something at the very, very end of this book where I talk about accounts payable. This is all I say about accounts pay payable. Accounts payable, remember here on this page is one of the topics here, accounts payable. So the only thing that I cover in accounts payable is the is this concept of uh, these words that sometimes show up on invoices 210 net 30 what it means and uh, for those of you who are accountants or would like to know how accountants handle it here are the journal entries having to do it but you ought to be f fine just if you know this much okay if you know this much and can dispense with the journal entries down below. Okay, it's uh, half past and uh, I want to end this webinar and thank you for being here today and participating and encourage you to come again next week where we uh, do a cram session I know for you, many of you the exam dates are coming up so this is a last chance to go through all of this material one more time and uh, what I will send you uh, and ask Brad to post are the sections of the book that, <clears throat> pardon me, that I think you ought to pay particular attention to uh, in your last minute study. All right, with that, I say goodbye to you, wish you a good rest of the week and a good weekend and look forward to our fifth time together next Thursday. Thanks, Christoph. Um, and just so everybody knows, I have updated with all of the information you've sent me on the website, and I will get the other things that you send me today uh, posted today, hopefully. All right. Thank you, and see you all next week. Bye-bye.